One of the things that we have stressed in our church through the years is the difference between the new covenant and the old covenant. And if you have heard me in past years, you know how that's a major subject in all of my preaching, partly because hardly anybody else speaks about it. And one big area of difference, there are many areas where there's difference where the standard is higher. Uh, things like, you know, in the Old Testament, adultery, physical adultery was the standard in the New Testament. Adultery in the thoughts in the Old Testament, murder in the New Testament, anger. The same way in the Old Testament, how you lived at home did not matter. That did not affect your ministry. How your children were brought up didn't matter. That didn't affect your ministry. <clears throat> but in the New Testament, it's fundamental. Now, there were exceptions in the Old Testament, but very rarely. Our duty is to manifest the truth of God's Word by our life. That's part of the meaning of the Word becoming flesh. Jesus is called the Word <clears throat> because the Word the words I speak are the expression of my thoughts. <clears throat> you can't see my thoughts, but you can hear my words. And no one could see God till Jesus came as an expression of the Father. <clears throat> so you could see in him what God was like. The word was made flesh. Now God's thoughts are in scripture. And those words must now become flesh in us. In other words give you some examples by the end of your life. As people look at your life and they, supposing they knew every detail of your life, <clears throat> all your thoughts, your financial dealings, every single thing, they should be able to say, boy, it's really true that if you see God's kingdom first and his righteousness, all the other things are added to you. Will they be able to say that about your life? I mean, if people knew every detail of your life, will they be able to say, this guy really sought God's kingdom first? We can give that impression on the outside. That doesn't matter because the, ultimately the testimony that matters is not what people say about you. But let me surprise you, what the devil says about you. You see that in the first book of the Bible, the book of Job, that's the first book written before Genesis. The preachers on earth, life as so far Bildad had a different opinion about Job, but Satan and God, they knew the real truth. And God didn't ask Eliphaz, Bildad and Zophar, who were great preachers, what do you think of Job? He couldn't care less for their opinion. I want to tell you to remember that. Don't worry about some preacher's opinion about you. God asked Satan, Satan. What do you think of my servant Job? That's the one God asks today. He doesn't need to ask, but he knows. But Satan's testimony is more important than man's testimony. Have you understood that from the book of Job? So, <clears throat> at the end of our life, our testimony should be, <clears throat> boy, if you really honor God, God honors you. There's no other way to explain this person's life. Then you can say words like, those who honor me I will honor have become flesh. Words like, seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness and all things will be added to you have become flesh in you. That's the meaning of being a witness for Christ. Being filled with the Holy Spirit, not bearing witness, but being a witness, which is a lot of difference. Bearing witness is just words. Hypocrites also bear, bear witness, but being a witness is more than giving tracts and things like that. So here is another verse that has to become flesh in us. Proverbs 22 and <clears throat> verse 6. Now, this was written by Solomon before he backslid, when God gave him wisdom. I always call Proverbs one of those rare 
new covenant books in the Old Testament. So many things here. God gives grace to the humble. Comes in Proverbs first. Uh, nowhere else in the Old Testament. And many other verses like that. Here's another one. Proverbs 22 verse 6. There's a command followed by a promise. A condition and a promise. The condition is, train up a child in the way he should go. And the promise is, when he's old, he will not depart from it. So if you have one child or ten children, <clears throat> I'm not saying they won't have ups and downs. I'm not saying they won't uh, act rebellious when they are two years old or three years old. Don't misunderstand. When they are old, they will not depart from it. In other words, when they are young, you train them, discipline them, and that may take a long time. It may take 30 years. But you will see that like Jesus came forth at 30, you'll find that when your child is old, he will not depart from it. Train up a child. Either that is God's word, it's true or it's a lie. And I'll tell you when you got to start, when they are one. They understand the truth when they are one year old. I mean, they may not be able to express themselves, but they can understand the word no and the way you say it. There's only one commandment given to children, obey your parents. That's the only thing we got to teach them. Right from the age of one. Let me show you a great example of that in the Old Testament. One of those rare examples. Genesis 18. Genesis 18, we read God saying about Abraham. Why did God choose Abraham? So why did God choose Abraham? Why did God fulfill his promise of blessing upon Abraham? Genesis 18, verse 19. Please remember this verse, all parents. God says concerning Abraham, I have chosen him, here's the reason, so that he may command his children and his family after him. To keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice again so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham all that he has spoken about him. Dear parents, please meditate on that verse. God didn't choose Abraham just to be the father of Israel. He chose him not to give suggestions to his children like parents do today. Look at that strong word. Command his children. Today's Psychologists who have no idea of God or Bible wouldn't say that. Don't command your children. Don't punish them. See how those children grow up? We're reaping the fruit today in Christian families around the world of Christian parents who 30 years ago, 50 years ago followed psychology more than the Bible. Abraham commanded his children And his family. And remember, Abraham didn't have a Bible. He didn't have meetings and fellowship and church and sermons. But he commanded his children. And because he did it, because he did it, the Lord could bring upon him all that he promised. There are many things the Lord wants to do for you, but he can't do it. Because you don't take seriously his word. When you come to the New Testament, we read in... 1 Timothy in chapter 3. An elder, before he can teach in the church, before he can be an elder, verse 5, must be able to manage his own family well. 1 Timothy 3, 5. Because if he cannot take care of three children at home, he's not going to take care of 300 people in a church. I mean, that's logical. If you can't train three wild horses, how are you going to train 300 of them? Do you think a man who owns horses, after he's tested a man with three horses and the guy's failed miserably training those three wild horses, will say, okay, here are 300 more wild horses, train them. No, even a man won't be so stupid and God is not. 
He doesn't give responsibility to a person who doesn't know how to bring up his own children, who puts the blame on others. That teaches us, if a man does not know how to bring up his family, how can he take care of God's house? Teaching us that the family comes before God's house. If you want a verse in scripture for that, there it is. The order that God has determined is first God, second your family, third the church and ministry. And a lot of people like Samuel travel here and there, travel here and there, ministry, 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 ministry. Look at the way their children grow up. David, now I must show you that verse, boy, man after God's own heart. 1 Kings chapter 1, this is an amazing verse. It's a man after God's own heart. But a lot of things which he did were wrong. He was a man after God's own heart up to the age of 30. After that, he slipped up tremendously once he became king. It's what usually happens to us. It's one of the fears I have for CFC. There was a day when many of us were poor. Were poor. We had time for God. Now many of us have become rich. We earn so much. And money has a way of taking our hearts away from God. We don't have time to pray so much. We watch television. And we have money to buy, buy better and better television sets and various gadgets. and uh, Because we have money now. The olden days, we didn't have money to buy these things. What would you do? We'd pray. We'd study the scriptures. God have mercy on a church that's drifting. You say you're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And you don't know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. That can happen to any church. 1 Kings chapter 1, when David became king, he sort of slackened off in his devotion to God. And it says he had a son called Adonijah. 1 Kings chapter 1, uh, verse 5. Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I'll be king. He was rebellious. And he wanted to fight against his father before his father died. And listen to them, the reason. His father, verse 6, had never crossed him once in his life, asking why have you done this? Because he was such a handsome man. You know, we have a sort of partiality towards good-looking children. If you have one girl and many boys, you're partial to that girl. Or you have one boy and many girls, you're partial to that boy. And it says here in the Message Bible, his father had spoiled him rotten as a child. Spoiled him rotten as a child. Never once reprimanding him. No wonder he grew up like that. I'll tell you, I have seen children in our churches, CFC churches, who have grown up like that. Despite all the messages they heard on family life, because they said, it won't happen to us. Dear brothers and sisters, we're living in terrible times. The schools are evil. Please take it seriously to fear God and bring up our children in the fear of God.